Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Nico Donahue. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of, of CDC. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you today to our, the latest in our Insight series. And it's also my pleasure uh, to welcome somebody that I have known and admired for a long time, and that is uh, John Elkington. And uh, John is, is the founder of uh, Volance. Uh, and you know, at a time when we all live in a world where um, questions of sustainability and, and actions and climate change and corporate responsibility are sort of front and center across the dialogue around the world and among governments and the private sector. Uh, it's fair to say that long before this subject became topical, there was John. And John was talking about, about them probably 40 years ago. Uh, and he's been described accurately as a writer, as a thought leader, as a serial entrepreneur. But most of all, he describes himself as an environmentalist. He is considered the godfather of sustainability. He's the originator of the term triple bottom line. He's authored 20 books, including the one uh, Green Swans, uh, the, coming, uh, the coming boom in regenerative capitalism that we're going to talk about today. He sat on, on 70 boards. He's advised scores of corporations and companies all around the world. The, his book, Green Swans, is described as a, as a draft manifesto for capitalism, democ uh, democracy, and sustainability. Um, so that's a big, big subject. It's hugely topical, and there's really nobody better qualified to talk about it today than John. So it's a, it's a great pleasure and a great privilege for me uh, to introduce John Elkington. Thank you, Nick, and um, hello, everyone. So I've been asked to just do a very short uh, presentation, which I will now... Uh, do with the blessing of um, technology. Okay, so um, it's a wonderful uh, privilege to be part of this Insight uh, series. I, I also admire CDC from a safe uh, distance and uh, I admire Nick uh, too. So I'm going to talk about um, green swans. I'm going to talk about the 2020s as uh, an exponential uh, decade. And I'll explain what I uh, mean by that. But some people um, in listening today uh, may know that about two years ago, I uh, did a product recall for the triple bottom line, which Nick just mentioned. Um, and the Harvard Business Review, which uh, was the channel for the recall, said that was the first time any management concept had ever been uh, recalled uh, to their knowledge. And so the thinking that I'm about to just share um, uh, flows on from that uh, time. And a lot of, went, lot of it went into the book, uh, Green Swans, which has already uh, been mentioned. And that word regenerative in the, uh, and particularly regenerative capitalism in the subtitle uh, may have struck uh, some people when the book came out in April as a little far-fetched. Could capitalism ever be regenerative? Well, some of you will also know that last week the CEO of Walmart, so the world's largest uh, retail company, regardless of what we uh, think about them, um, uh, announced uh, in New York as part of Climate Week that Walmart was committing to become a regenerative company. Now, I'm not kind of claiming <laughs> agency here. Uh, I've picked up on something that was happening more broadly, but I think uh, anyone who was thinking this was delusional uh, might just pay a little bit more attention to what's going on in major companies now. So uh, the exponential decade, let me just say a little bit more uh, about that. Um, when I started to talk about that term uh, last year, it may again have sounded a bit strange, uh, but now you've had the Gates Foundation just in recent weeks uh, talking about uh, then the previous 25 weeks having wiped out uh, 25 years of progress in the development world. So I, I don't need to sort of underscore the impact of the pandemic of COVID-19, but it is an extraordinary time. I actually happen to think that it could actually benefit us, not just simply uh, destroy in a way. Um, and one of the things I've been trying to say to companies, which is largely where we focus our efforts uh, since the Sustainable Development Goals came out uh, in 2015, is that they are not simply incre incremental goals. They are system change goals. And you can view them as uh, exponential goals uh, as well. If you just take the first two, no poverty and zero hunger uh, by 2030, that's a super exponential 
pair of goals. And yet most people in business uh, and in the financial markets are not yet uh, seeing them in quite that way. And part of the reason is that our brains really were not configured uh, to think exponentially or to act uh, exponentially. And yet that is where we now uh, are and that's what we now need to learn how to do. So where in all of that do uh, swans of various colors fit in? So pretty much everyone uh, listening in will have heard of Nassim Nicholas Taleb and I suspect most of you will have read uh, at least part of his book, uh, The Black Swan, which came out in 2007, just before uh, the financial crash. Uh, and people have been asking him uh, left, right and center recently, is COVID-19 a black swan? In fact, they've been assuming that it is. And his answer is, no, it's not. Because a proper black swan is an outlier in the sense that it's a complete surprise. It has an extreme off the scale uh, impact. Uh, and unfortunately, after it's uh, uh, crashed through, we look back at what's just happened to us and we don't properly understand uh, why whatever happened did happen and therefore we set ourselves up for failure again. So black swans, um, we uh, understand a bit better. What about green swans? Uh, well, green swans for me are um, uh, trajectories, trends, initiatives, developments, which instead of black swans, which take us uh, exponentially very often where we don't want to go, green swans at least potentially take us exponentially where we do. Uh, want to go. So I'm not going to read out the definitions, uh, but simply to say these are not individual companies. These are not individual uh, leaders, although you know, leaders and companies may well have green swan characteristics or uh, development banks or, or, or whatever else. But for me, they're market shifts uh, and they're profound market shifts. So uh, when I'm asked to give an example, one of the ones I've given in recent times is the European Union's uh, Green Deal it's sort of green recovery plan, which has got very strong uh, social inclusion and, and decarbonization uh, components. And whatever it is, 1.82 trillion uh, euros uh, pledged uh, in that general uh, direction. Well, we'll see how that plays out. Uh, and I'm always suspicious of big numbers, uh, particularly put out by the uh, European Commission. But nonetheless, this level of ambition, uh, I think is exactly what we need to see. Now, as it happens, um, a number of digitally driven technologies, as we all know, are going in an extraordinary uh, direction and very, in, in a way, very complementary direction. So if you look at solar here, or you look at wind, or you look at increasingly a, a battery technology, uh, the energy uh, industry is in the process of being transformed. And there's a group called Rethink X that have looked at transportation. They've looked at the cattle and dairying, uh, industries and they see very similar patterns of exponential uh, disruption. Now, of course, any new technological or economic uh, development brings unintended consequences. Uh, and if, if I just stick with the renewable energy uh, piece for a moment, you know, whether it's solar arrays now coming to the end of their useful life or, or, or the wind vanes of uh, air generators, we suddenly find that we don't know what to do the, with these things. You know, we talk about circular economies, but how do we bring these toxic solar arrays or, or these huge great bits of non-recyclable uh, uh, wind power machinery back into the uh, economy? And it's very difficult uh, to work out how we will do that with the previous generation of products, but hopefully we can design future ones better. One of the things just towards the conclusion that we're seeing uh, a growing number of interesting leadership companies doing is recognizing that this is not simply additional, this is not simply citizenship, something strapped on the edge of what they do. This is simply about future markets. This is about what's going to be required of them, of businesses uh, over time. And they also are beginning to understand both that they can't do this on their own, individual companies can't do this on their own, they've got to partner, but also, the people in their organizations who best understand uh, the emerging uh, realities of their younger people. So this is a um, company, Spanish company, Acciona, that we've been working with. They're an infrastructure and renewable energy company, but operating globally. And they've been pulling out 30 of the fast track younger people, trying to bring them into the decision making now rather than leading it 
uh, until a lot later. Now, we did a, a report with the World Business Council for Sustainable Development uh, earlier this year on COVID-19 and its impact and its implications, uh, which I, I didn't uh, write myself, I, I recommend, because I think it some useful insights in that. But on the right, you have a diagram that Bill Sharp originally put together, the Three Horizons model. And, and we've been populating it uh, with uh, a series of events that we've done with companies and uh, also with a regulatory agency, the Scottish Environmental uh, Protection uh, Agency. And what I think we see is an old order declining, a period where we talked a lot and tried to deliver uh, responsibility in various different forms, responsibility, accountability, transparency, and so on. But now what we're hearing is more and more leaders talking uh, about resilience. And the Financial Times today had a, a, a section on um, supply chain resilience. Uh, but the unfortunate thing is that you can't just simply wish resilience into a national economy or into an economic region or into an industry or into uh, a company or whatever you've got to invest in resilience and, and, and the development world has known this uh, for a very long time. So that's why regeneration is going to become increasingly important. Some people have um, uh, suggested that regeneration is likely to be sustainability on steroids. I don't see that. I, I, I think sustainability remains an important concept, but it's slightly static. Regeneration is not. We've got to regenerate our economies, our societies, and most crucially of all, uh, our biosphere. So if I may, I'll um, say thank you uh, at this stage of the game uh, and, and, and ha hand over control of the slides and hand back to Mick. Thank you, John. Um, thank you. So I'm gonna ask, I have, a, I have a, a, a number of questions I'm gonna put to John. And then also we have on the, on the screen uh, a Q and A function. So I'd encourage you all, we'll have 15 minutes at the end after we've talked to John, after uh, we've talked also to Emily Ammon from our climate strategist from JP Morgan, we'll have an opportunity uh, to answer your questions. So I'd encourage you to put, um, to, to use the Q&A function and uh, to input the questions. So John, let me start, and I suppose I'm gonna start it a little bit uh, skeptically in the <laughs> sense that um, what you're talking about is, a, is, a, is really a profound sort of systemic shift. And, um, and you know, we know when we when we go to or when we see uh, leaders, corporate leaders at Davos and speaking all around the world, that sustainability is really one of the things that's absolutely uppermost in their mind. But then when you look at, and I was responsible at JP Morgan for running a large team of analysts, and analysts look at the, yeah. uh, evaluate companies' performance, um, and they build financial models and they forecast the, uh, share prices. They don't have any data to go on when it comes to sustainability, so they don't really consider it. Uh, most companies, chief executives, to be fair, are largely driven by the their 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 sort of compensation is largely driven by their their the sh their share price. So I suppose the question is whether or not this systemic change can really happen with through without some form of incentives. And people talk about the importance, for example, of carbon taxes. Uh, people talk more recently about the need for more impact weighted accounts. Um, so I suppose the question is really, is, 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 can this work without a significant change in the way we incentive, in the way we look at companies, measure companies' performance and incentivize chief executives? Well, the simple answer, Nick, and you know it, is, the, uh, is no, uh, we need incentives. But incentives can be painful and they can be pleasurable, they can be negative, they can be positive. And I think what we're seeing, um, I did a, a chair a session in the city of London a couple of weeks back and, and um, the head of uh, Federated Hermes was there. And one of the things he was saying was, here we suddenly are in a transformed reality and things that were considered completely impossible have suddenly been done by companies, by, you know, to some degree, financial markets, but particularly by uh, governments. So the incentive, incentives are coming at us. And at the moment, it's a pandemic and there will be more of those. Be behind that is Amelie's um, area of the climate emergency. And behind that, uh, you know, you've got the biodiversity problems and a, a range of other issues uh, as well. 
But I think we're at actually a very interesting inflection point. And I think uh, the New York Times last week um, published a, um, a piece on Milton Friedman's uh, um, uh, 50 year old now um, statement of what the purpose of business was. Um, and I think Friedman has uh, a very brilliant man, but he's, he's, he's dictated the terms of economic discourse for a very long period of time. And in one way or another, reality is showing that Friedmanism takes you so far, but it really doesn't uh, uh, set you up uh, for success in, in, in the sort of realities that we're now moving uh, into. And then just a final thing to your point about metrics and measurement and analysts and all the rest of it. There's no question that the environment, social and governance, ESG industry uh, has done better than many other parts of the financial markets in, 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 in this sort of crisis. But I don't think that if we scaled up ESG as it currently is, and everyone in the financial world started to use ESG techniques and models and the rest of it, that we would have saved the world, delivered the sustainable development goals or anything like that. So I think we're, at, we're actually at the very early stages of a very rapid evolutionary yeah. curve. And I think the development banks have a crucial role to play in all of that. Yeah. Let's stay in Friedman for a second, because the other thing that Friedman talked about was the role of government or the absence yeah. of a role yeah. for government. And so, um, so what what are your thoughts on? And as well there, we talk about we uh, you know taxes and accounting requirements and so on. But what do you think the role for government is in in all in in ensuring this transition takes place? Well, one of uh, for me at least, one of Friedman's most memorable lines was something. Um, to the effect that uh, if you put the federal government in the United States in charge of the Sahara, you would run out of sand in five years. Well, it was a it was a it was a memorable line, um, and and at times I'm sure governments play uh, into that sort of prejudice. But I don't think there's any way in which business and financial markets, even if working in concert, can do all of this on their own. Governments absolutely have to play uh, a, a role, but it has to be an effective one. And so government has to be as far as possible clean. So the bribery and corruption sort of agenda is even more important in the era that we're going into uh, than it was um, previously. It's got to have sound targeting and, and a way of monitoring um, uh, progress against those sort of goals and targets, but critically, and this is your earlier point, there have got to be incentives. We cannot simply uh, rely on people to do this because this is the right thing for their children or their grandchildren or you know, billions of people elsewhere in the world. They've got to be incentivized. And that's particularly true if you're dealing with uh, economies and capitalism and, 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 and business and so on. Now, those, business, those incentives, once again, can be tax breaks and things like that, but they can also be uh, 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 penalties, I mean, where, where um, uh, industries like the fossil fuels industry, which are demonstrably undermining uh, the health of our climate, need to be taxed over time out of existence. So your point about carbon tax, absolutely fundamentally important. We've taken a very long time to get there, but the nature of the, the world in which we're moving into the 2020s is what has been described as a, a gradually then suddenly world where we think we know what's going on and what's going to take us into the future. And then boom, it could be COVID, it could be something else, but we're suddenly scrambling to do new stuff and work out how, where we fit into a, a transformed uh, order. So government's essential. The other issue, uh, I suppose, also pertinent to incentives is the question of, and I know you've done this, has this in, have enormous experience in working with so many large and small, co smaller companies around the world. There's a question of how you change the culture of a company. And, yeah. you know, we, we are all inspired. Paul Polman wrote the, 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 the sort of prologue introduction to your book. He's an inspiring leader that clearly changed the culture of a, of a large company. But that's a difficult thing to do. And, and when you're and, and what often seems to happen is that you people get to become they get to chief executive, then they start talking about sustainability and they start talking about corporate responsibility. But underneath it, you've got all the other people 
all trying to become the chief executive who still stay focused on the sort of bread and butter business of, 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 of sort of maximizing, maximizing returns. So based on your experience, what do you tell companies and what do you tell chief executives and boards about this element, about how culture can change? Well, it's funny because today we've got a, um, a new board member. Um, he's German. He used to run one of the Bosch companies both the CEO and chairman. And one of the things he was saying a moment ago was um, that you've got, a, as a C, an incoming CEO, you've probably got about a year and a half in which you can make a big change. And after that, you're just overwhelmed by uh, events. And you mentioned Paul Pullman, and uh, one of the most memorable things Paul did was right at the beginning of his tenure was to say to the hedge funds, if you want to know what I'm going to deliver in terms of financial performance a quarter or you know, three quarters ahead I don't want your money now that was uh, no CEO to my knowledge had previously done that now Paul himself said if it had been three years in he couldn't have done that but just his board probably didn't want to sack him uh, as soon as he um, arrived so I, I think there's a, there's a personal courage element of this there's a timing element of, of this I also think one of the things that um, business leaders have woken up to is Elements of what they're being asked to do now are already happening elsewhere. And so one of the things uh, uh, that can be useful is to selectively pick out competitors, customer industries, whatever, that are already modeling some of the new mindsets uh, and, and, and behaviors and so on, and go and see them. So it used to be, you mentioned my 40-year uh, uh, criminal record. Well, a lot of the early years were spent bringing Greenpeace and Oxfam and Transparency International into major companies and saying, look, don't just trust us, listen to these people and, and hear their view. Um, so that was bringing the uh, external reality in. Now we're seeing uh, uh, leadership groups starting to go, groups like um, Leaders Quest, taking people out and showing them very different realities that could well become uh, make or break uh, for these particular companies. So I think um, you've got to have courage. Uh, you've got to be willing to talk to people who are very different uh, from you. And some of those people are inside your own company. And I think one of the things that uh, I mentioned with the Actiona thing, uh, you, you're starting to see the top teams and companies realizing that the real market intelligence, the, the intelligence about the future directions of markets are actually among their own people, their young people, and they somehow got to find a way of bringing these people through, not just listening to them because they don't necessarily yet know everything they need to know, but sending them out as ambassadors to learn and come back uh, with new knowledge. Yeah. yeah. So let's um, change the subject a little bit. One of the most, I found one of the most interesting uh, chapters in, in the book was where you talked about the role of technology and you touched on that in your, in your presentation. And you talked about some of the, uh, the, some of the more specific sort of technological breakthroughs that you think are enabling this yeah. this sort of systemic change. Talk about those. Well, I, you know, I, I, I love technology. I find science and technology absolutely fascinating, but I equ I'm equally aware that technology, particularly major uh, systemic shifts in technology, bring... Uh, unintended consequences. And I, I've been really very disappointed when I've gone to Silicon Valley over the years and I've asked people one standard question, which is, um, do they know of Thomas Midgley Jr.? And the answer is almost, uh, I've only met one person who did. And the reason I ask, and it's in the book, and so you, you know, um, is that Thomas Midgley Jr. gave us leaded gasoline. I mean, he had 100 patents to his name. He was a brilliant chemical engineer, but he, he was at his height uh, with General Motors and um, uh, DuPont in, in the 20s, 1920s and 1930s. He gave us leaded gasoline. He gave us CFC, his freons. So he, he's been described as a single uh, in organism in Earth's history that has done most damage to the planet. He blew the stratospheric ozone uh, hole. Um, and, and then uh, tragically, he succumbed to polio and, and built a robotic bed and it strangled him. Um, and I only tell that because you know, as a species, we love technology. We think solar, we think uh, whatever it is gonna, computer um, 
power is going to save us. And, and we have to be very much more cautious than I think we're sometimes inclined uh, to be. So I think technology is fascinating. I think what's going to come at uh, sector after sector, I mentioned Rethink X. One of the things they're looking at is the way, for example, precision fermentation in the uh, uh, cattle and dairy industry will remove about 60% of the cattle in the United States. That's just the US. Uh, but this will have implications around uh, the world. And this is synthetic meat, synthetic fish, synthetic chicken. Now, these sorts of technologies have massive consequences. Now, I happen to be a vegetarian, so you know I'm, I'm, I slightly welcome anything that uh, means fewer animals are killed. But the consequences of this are profound. And I, very often, I don't think that the government uh, policymakers are yet paying sufficient attention to how we integrate these new technologies without without um, uh, doing a great deal of collateral damage along the way. So let's before we uh, before we bring in Emily, uh, let's just uh, as a final question talk about the role of investment. And I'm particularly interested in two sort of two different classes of investors. One is the impact investment community, which has obviously grown up substantially in the last uh, decade or so. And what role you think, how important a movement is that? And what role do you think that that uh, that uh, that plays in this change? And also, obviously, specifically within that, I suppose, broad community of impact investment firms, the development finance community, and what role that they, what organizations like CDC, what roles you think uh, uh, we can can and should be playing? Well, the, the, the one thing, Nick, I, I think we're all seeing now is that the financial market, after a long period of recalcitrance, is waking up. And different parts of it are waking up in different ways to different challenges or opportunities and so on, and, and at different speeds. But you look at the insurance and the reinsurance. Uh, industry and, and to the climate change issue that we're about to talk about. Um, you know, the insurers are now saying at three degrees, pretty much all the world is uninsurable. So you know, you, you've got that sort of message coming through and, and some of the insurance groups are obviously big investors and they're in. Right, now I think impact investment is immensely exciting. I think the way in which we've gone from a world where we only thought, I used to do environmental impact assessment um, in, 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 in emerging and developing countries and so on. And, and we were almost exclusively looking for problems, the negative footprints. Now we're thinking much more constructively about um, the, the positive impacts. And we're thinking about how we uh, measure positive impact and how we value it and how we reward and incentivize people uh, for all of that good stuff. Now, I, I, I'm immensely excited about that. I chair a, um, an advisory board within Novartis, where we're trying to put financial uh, valuations on social and uh, environmental progress. But I think the in impact investment, it, it's grown spectacular, as you said, but $500 billion, that's a rounding error, not quite, but it's still very, very small uh, uh, proportion of the trillions of euros of dollars that sluice through the uh, 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 global economy uh, routinely. And then to the question around, so, but I, so I, I think it's really important, but I, I don't think we should overestimate the short by which I mean five to 10 year impact of some of that stuff. But I think it will be uh, over time decisive. Um, then to the development banks, I think they're absolutely foundational. I think they're absolutely critical. I think you know, in, in many ways, the whole sort of Bretton Woods structure was built up around uh, the development uh, bank principle and many of the early uh, impact mindsets and methodologies were pioneered there. Uh, the one thing I would love to see, though, is that at the moment it strikes me very often that individual development banks and uh, international um, development institutions are doing their own things so often. And I don't want a Vatican, I don't want everyone to suddenly sort of come under uh, one roof, but I do wish we had uh, more coordinated efforts. And just finally, the four big accounting companies just having announced within the last week and a half that they were going to come together and produce a single standard uh, for sustainability reporting. On the one hand, I'm immensely excited about that. On the other hand, having seen Ernst and Young just to name one and Wirecard, you just wonder, uh, are, are we replacing one uh, problem with another? But we do need integrated standards. And I think uh, the development banks have a crucial role to play in that, not just in mobilizing capital. Great. Thanks, John. So at this point, I'm going to bring in Amelie. Amelie Amin is the
um, the, uh, the head of climate strategy at CDC. She worked for a long time in, in a climate role at, at the UK government and with the, uh, with the IBD in Washington. Um, so we're enormously pleased to have Amelie at CDC. And I'm going to ask her to talk, maybe share her reflections, not just on what she's seen in CDC in the last uh, six months or so, but what she's seen develop um, over the last uh, progress the, uh, what progress which she's seen over the last uh, 10 years and then specifically talk maybe a little bit Emily about CDC what we're doing and how we're laying out our climate strategy and then after then I'll, I'll, I'll come back and we'll have a conversation between Emily and John so Emily thank you um, and it's yeah it's a great honor and privilege to be uh, with well both of you in in terms of you know leading this agenda of sustainability and impact uh, I and having um, you know, I think in the midst of the COVID, uh, early stages of COVID, I, I read a review of Green Swans and um, I must say it fed, it gave me a lot of, it heartened me a lot in terms of um, the whole thesis that you put forward, uh, John, around that, uh, you know, that we can and, you know, if we have the political will and leadership uh, that now really in this coming decade is the time for rejuvenate, regeneration. Um, and to a large extent, I think, you know, most of my career and my, certainly my academic background, I did my PhD at Spru, um, uh, which was set up by uh, Chris, uh, Chris Freeman, um, Carlotta Perez, who was there for many years. And in fact, my PhD very much based on Carlotta Perez's techno-economic paradigms and implications for development. And, um, you know, so reading, in fact, what was then a review of your book, um, it, it made me feel like maybe what was happening now with COVID was, was the big sort of disjuncture that we needed to actually be able to really, as many say now, build back better. Um, you know, this, the crisis that where the global economy comes to a stop, as it did, uh, provides an opportunity to actually, you know, build back in a way that is consistent with sustainable development, including tackling climate change and obviously the breakdown in biodiversity. And, you know, I think having studied that, that's where my academic um, background comes from. I've, I've been trying to do that throughout my various roles in government, um, uh, 10 years in the UK government, seven years in total at the Inter-American Development Bank. So, and in fact, a large part of my work at the IDB was very much, as you just said, John, trying to improve how the, um, the MDBs in particular collaborate more effectively. And I increasingly, and I think, again, this is sort of a reflection on what I've seen over the last 20 years, in fact, working in this area, is that there's been, um, and myself included, a huge focus on the international architecture um, for very, very good reasons. But increasingly, what I've started to see is you know, it really doesn't matter what happens at the international architecture level in terms of how development banks collaborate if it's not working at the country level, if you're not bringing together uh, different resources, expertise, areas of comparative advantage, different forms of finance, uh, public finance, uh, of course, you know, the kind of capital that CDC brings, uh, the expertise that we can bring, you know, all of these things have to come together at the country level. And, and that's what I would say over the last 10, 20 years, I've increasingly come to that conclusion. Um, I would say that I do believe that the Paris Agreement um, was an incredible achievement. It was much more ambitious than uh, anyone anticipated it would be. It also places at its heart uh, sustainable development and also this issue of economic uh, transformation and transition. And I think that along with the SDGs all reinforces the points your book makes very, very eloquently, John, around this being this next decade being really the critical time uh, and hopefully one of exponential change. Because I, I believe, and again, coming from SPRU, which is sort of focused on the role of technology um, in, uh, uh, and in fact, SPRU's Chris Freeman made his name by writing a critique of the Limits to Growth uh, book, which you obviously will, will be aware of, uh, John. Um, you know, but I think te the technology is there. We can't say we don't have the technology. The issue is, do we have the right uh, institutions? Are the institutions um, uh, reinforcing the, the best use of the technology we have? 
uh, in a way that can lead to the types of changes we know that society really wants. I mean, we all want to deliver on those SDGs and we want to uh, live and we want our our children and uh, you know grandchildren to be able to live in an environment that uh, where they can breathe uh, safely, where they can um, you know uh, they're, they're not being polluted at their very source. So um, you know I think uh, this next ten years is critical, and uh, I'll probably stop there because I, there may be another question around COP twenty six, but I, I do also believe that COP twenty six can be hopefully can can hatch. Uh, a lot of potential ducklings that can become those green green swans that you talk about. Thanks, Emily. And uh, remember, for all of you, if you've got questions, you can put them on the on on the Q and A function. John, I want to come back. I mean, did, Emily mentioned uh, touched on the sort of the great issue of the day, which is COVID, and and the, and potentially the opportunity that gives us to have a sort of a reset and build back better. I mean, there's also uh, there's a school of thought that says. Actually, a, a crisis of this magnitude, an economic crisis, uh, as, uh, as well as a, obviously a health crisis of this magnitude, could actually derail the powerful me momentum that was building up behind the need to address the climate emergency. So I wonder how you feel about that. Well, I, on, on bad days, I'm, I'm a pessimist, and I think the whole world is going to hell in a handbasket or a handcart or whatever it is meant to go to hell in. Um, but uh, on, on good days, and I was born an optimist, you have to be, if you're going to be in a field like this one, uh, referring back to limits to growth onwards. Um, I, I think on net net from what I'm seeing at the moment in the business world, the effect is profoundly positive. I see CEOs beginning to be uncomfortably aware that the systemic crises that they had been warned about are not only a reality, but they're, they're stacked up one behind another. And they, they, to some degree, they link to each other. So COVID is brought to us by courtesy of wildlife trafficking and bat guano uh, digging in caves and subway systems and airlines and so on. We've, we've, we've created a, a, a global system that is very vulnerable indeed to all sorts of shocks. Uh, now, we happen to have one demonstration uh, at the moment, we might well have other uh, pandemics, but there will be other shocks. And you know, one pandemic that uh, people often don't think about is um, obesity and chronic disease and diabetes. And I've worked with a Danish company uh, for a long time, uh, Nova Nordisk, looking at the way in which the, the shock of that pandemic uh, could well collapse public healthcare uh, systems in different parts of the world. So I'm not trying to sort of do the Old Testament piece of sort of uh, renting renting my um, uh, cloak and uh, sh showering ashes on my head, but I am saying that we are moving into a much more challenging and a much more potentially dangerous period of our collective history. Our global governance systems that were constructed largely after the Second World War are no longer fit for purpose and they're beginning to fail. And my own sense, and in the book, the first diagram is uh, a, a U-band, and it goes back to what just Amelie was saying, which is, I think there are long wave economic cycles in our economies. I think we are now in, into uh, the down, downward part of the, the latest down wave. And these things do not recover overnight. They don't, you don't get a V-shaped or a U-shaped or a W-shaped recovery. These are things that will take 12 to 15 years if we're lucky and a generation or two if we're not uh, to really crank through. So to your question, is this a bad thing? It depends. It depends what we choose uh, to make of it. And if we choose to react in the right way, uh, I think it could be a fantastic opportunity. Terrible thing to say with a million people already dead and, and a lot more uh, likely to die. But we needed a shock like this. And the and, and, um, question is now, what do we do with it? Um, can I take the conversation back towards something that's really quite specific, um, well, more uh, specific to some of the development banks? And one of the yeah. challenges that we face, maybe, Emily, I'll go to you in this first, but one of the challenges that we face is, to some extent, there's a, there's a, there's a need to sort of balance. On the one hand, for example, in Africa, we have 650 million people who don't have access to, uh, to reliable power. Uh, in many of those, in many in many countries, gas is the cheapest source of the cheapest sort of fuel source available. Um, 
how do we reconcile that, you know, addressing that challenge of access to power with the obvious challenges of, 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 of the climate emergency and the need as much as possible to eliminate, eliminate uh, uh, carbon fuel? So, uh, Amelie, I know that's something that you think about a lot at CDC, so why don't you start? Thank you. Yeah, I think about and talk about a lot yeah. as well uh, with many people. Um, you know, I think my view is that we have to deliver on the SDGs, uh, electricity, whether it's access at the sort of household level or for industrial growth and development is, is essential. And um, at the moment for many of the countries that CDC in particular um, serves, uh, gas probably is the first, the necessary uh, investment that is needed in the next five to 10 years alongside a lot of investment in the grid infrastructure so that then actually the these countries can start to bring in more renewables particularly utility scale renewables storage as we see as you said john that's an, another exponential technology in terms of coming down the, the rate at which the costs are coming down um, but uh, we can't wait uh, for the grid systems to be uh, ready to absorb uh, these technologies uh, and people people need power electricity now so um, you know so I, I do see it's there is an important role and I think that is and can and should be consistent with actually where we need to be on climate change I mean I think you know I think what we've seen for countries uh, you know in the announcement and actually it was very interesting to see the Walmart announcement I think that had passed me by I think I was more focused on China's announcement, mm. but you know China's announcement um, to be net zero by 2060. Uh, I think many are calling that game changing in terms of international politics and how that, uh, you know, how the climate agenda moves. And probably that commitment alone, they estimate, could take you know 0.3 um, of a centigrade off the the current path we're we're facing. Um, and I think it's those economies that are heavily reliant on coal and how quickly they can transition, not necessarily into gas, but into renewables, whilst recognizing that the, the less developed countries, you know, will need to increase more in gas power to, to develop and, and then be able to bring in more renewables over time. John, you agree with that? I totally agree with it. I mean, you kindly identified me as an environmentalist, so people might assume that I'm going to um, uh, resist that. But I actually think we're fa focus, facing nested crises. And if we don't address the social dimensions of the global goals, we're going to have a collapse that way. If we don't address the environmental ones, the, the same thing. And we've somehow got to, and this has always been the spirit and always the intent and ambition of uh, sustainable development, we've got to be much better at bringing these things uh, together. And I think there is an urgency that comes from the social crises or whatever, which mean that we've got to just throw whatever we got at uh, those sort of problems. And I think the transition from one form of energy has to be absolutely fundamentally built into whatever we do. And as long as that's happening, uh, then the, you know, I'm, 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 I'm more relaxed, although people like me will no doubt be arguing that they uh, time scales, even for China, 2060 uh, is a long time away, although the scale of what they're promising to do is just outlandish. Uh, and I, I agree, Emily, I think it is potentially uh, a game changer. I hope it's a game changer in the country itself, uh, yeah. but we'll see. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about something else that we hope will be a game changer, and that's COP26. Yeah. And um, obviously a huge priority for the UK government. Um, so what, what needs, if you were advising um, uh, um, uh, the, the government on, um, and I know Amelie is advising the government on COP26, I mean, what advice would you give them? So, uh, what can they do to really make this a game-changing moment? Well, the obvious thing is to say, don't field uh, an all-male uh, team. <laughs> I th I, no, I, genu I, I really mean it, because um, you look at the countries that have dealt with COVID-19, well, and many of them are run by uh, women. I mean, it's an obvious point. And if you look at the ESG fund performance through the pandemic, many of the ones uh, that have done well are actually also either run by women or have quite a high proportion of women. So when I see the UK government doing that, I think it, it, it is a, I don't know, it, 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 it's a declaration of intent and it's an intent that I really don't either trust or, or uh, 
uh, believe in. So I plenty of time to change um, the, the gender balance. Now that's only one piece of this, but I also think the, 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 the youth element of the equation is absolutely fundamentally important. I've been out on some of the uh, school climate change marches and I've talked to some of the young people uh, who've been involved in that. And I think we are at a very interesting phase in all this where we can either lose or we can gain uh, younger people. I think they are increasingly anxious and the danger is that it'll flash over into, into anger about climate. And, and, and now you've got all the other things that are being uh, dumped in their collective lap. So I think we've got to break with precedent with COP26. We've got to do things that are absolutely uh, almost unbelievable to the wider world. So whether it's Walmart or China, for God's sake, Boris, uh, the rest of the world is trying to model uh, for you how you might uh, do this uh, sensibly. Sorry, that's going slightly off piste and slightly political. But I, the, the one thing I would say is that all of this has become now with a small b fundamentally political and we're going to have to do the politics in the way that you know, people like myself have sort of tried to shy away from uh, for a very long period of time now it's it's real we've got to do the politics Emily what are you advising the government on COP26 <laughs> well <laughs> I don't know where to begin um no I think you know I mean, there's a lot of uh I think what's really great about the COP26 agenda is that they're focused on the negotiations but then they also want to use the opportunity and the UK's leadership, uh, both of COP26 as well as um, uh, the G7, and actually also Italy's also partnering on COP26 and is G20 host as well. So um, how to really make uh, a significant impact in, in the real economy and in, you know, in, in a few key areas. And you know, the clean energy transition is one that they've prioritized particularly working with those countries that are heavily reliant on coal, so India and South Africa, in particular in our regions, um, to make that kind of more rapid transition out of coal. There's a very strong focus on nature-based solutions. Uh, and also, um, in, as, as we know, because we're already locked into certain climate impacts, uh, the, the need to focus more on adaptation and resilience. And so I think in all those three areas, and then finance, both public and private, is sort of underpinning all of those uh, three areas. And I think there is um, a real, uh, you know, how the UK can show leadership through COP26, through the G7, through G20, but also very, very importantly through bilateral engagement with countries uh, to really start to make the systemic changes that are going to be needed. And I think all of those activities beyond the negotiations itself um, are going to hopefully really uh, create the basis for this, uh, hopefully an exponential um, decade where we really do start to deliver on the SDGs and ensure significant progress towards the Paris Agreement by 2030. Thank you. So um, let's go. Uh, we want to, we've got, I think, 10 minutes left. So I want to just, uh, we've had a, a number of questions from the audience. And so I wanted just to try to run through some of those if I can. So first one for you, John, is, I suppose we're back to the politics, but can you talk about how much harm is being done by the current political situation in the United States? Interesting, the comparison to China, which just mentioned. Can the rest of the world make significant progress if the US is not willing to be part of the effort? Um, simple answer, probably not. Uh, uh, a, a, a less simple answer is it's probably going to have to, um, almost regardless of what happens in November. Um, I felt for several years now, and I, you know, I love the US, I have family there, I have lots of friends, um, but it's a civil war. Uh, and, and we remember what happened with the last one and how long that took uh, to clear. Um, this is a breakdown, almost a nervous breakdown of a superpower. And, and we saw it uh, happen with the Soviet Union uh, before. I also believe that the United States has the capacity to reinvent itself. It does that periodically. And in some ways, I think we shouldn't just panic and think, you know, they're going to go off uh, in a completely different direction. We're going to be left uh, becalmed. We've got to keep on trucking with the, the good stuff that uh, is been doing and I think you know American CEOs and business leaders that we talk to uh, just look with complete awe or horror at things like the European uh, 
uh, Green Deal, for example, because they, they, they don't see very much uh, evidence of that. And yet, you know, we, we, we look at what's happening in the Trump White House, and it's look, like looking into a rat's nest. I mean, in a way, it sort of doesn't matter, because at the same time, you've got cities, you've got some states, you've got companies uh, developing the new technologies of the future. And it, this is almost like a I don't know how, quite how to, uh, it, it, it would seem to belittle the, the, the importance of what's going on in the United States at the moment. But in a way, there's a momentum building around the new economic order. And in a way, the pol politics are struggling, not only to catch up or keep up, but actually what we're seeing with the Trump and many of the populists, you see it, and I won't list the <laughs> countries, but including our own, um, where people are trying to hold on to the uh, old order. And, and the more the old order gets shaken, which I believe is going to happen with a growing intensity, the more people will go back to what they feel confident with. And you see Scott Robinson, uh, the prime minister of uh, Australia, holding up a piece of coal uh, just in the midst of the uh, fires there and saying, this is the future. And you think, what's going on in that man's that man's mind and I think you're going to see a huge wave of or, or, or a raft of political leaders and CEOs being swept out because they're no longer uh, fit for purpose doesn't mean that the next ones in are going to be dramatically better but their, their mindsets will be different and therefore they'll be better prepared to help us all cope with what's coming at us both both risks and opportunities Okay, another question, John, for you. Um, somebody asking, some people like Mark Benioff are talking about building stakeholder capitalism. What do you make of it? Does that ally with your thinking? Is it <laughs> well, of course it does. But um, you look back 40 years and you saw the Business Roundtable that made that declaration, 180 some uh, as CEOs, one British and the rest American, um, and they were going to go into stakeholder capitalism. Well, hallelujah. But they said exactly the same thing 40 years ago. Um, so we've got to really keep a close watch on uh, these CEOs and, and the people as you know, the people who invest in them, as you said uh, earlier on, uh, Nick, I, we've really got to step up and we've got to almost assume now that the money, the resources that we've struggled to get in the past to do what we wanted to do from limits to growth onwards are now not the problem. The problem is what are we going to do and how are we going to make that work for uh, pretty much everyone on the planet? And how are we going to do whatever we intend to do in, 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 in time? Um, and so that, that's why I think we, we did a, um, a conference early on in this year in January with Aviva investors, 300 people. And right across the wall, the, the, the uh, message was step up or get out of the way. And I'm directing that challenge at myself, not just in our, our organization. I think it's one that we've all got to address to whatever we're planning to do. Um, yeah, enough. Okay, so another question, I'll start with you in this one, Emily, is on, you know, we've talked about government, we've talked about um, sort of private sector and co companies, but what is the role for the general public? Um, and to what, to what extent do we need to see a consumer-led demand for sustainability? As well as uh, as well as galvanizing companies into change. So. Yeah, no, that that's a yeah. I mean, it's a key issue. I think you know we're already seeing, and and particularly with demographic change, and as as John emphasised, you know, as the sort of millennials are now um, using well, not just voting power, but you know, their purchasing power is starting to have more effect. Um, you know, I think we are seeing changes, quite significant changes. Uh, you know, I think it's interesting having lived in the US for a while, I, I really, I, I, I saw far, far less of that in the US than I, than I see here in Europe. And it really does feel like a very different place in terms of the social um, demand now and the, the you know, it's, it's becoming much more, sustainability is much more embedded in the culture of Europe. And, you know, of course, differences across different European countries. And I do include the UK and Europe because we are still part of the, the continent. We haven't we haven't detached and floated off and attached to another continent. Um, uh, but uh, so so I do see a lot of uh, and I think the, I think also the other sort of important area is also um, 
uh, issue of savings and, you know, where do we put our, you know, as we hear um, this, you know, make my money matter and all of that. I think that also is going to be increasingly important um, in, in sort of influencing both government, but more importantly, in, investors as well. So I think, yes, it's very important. Um, it's, uh, it's probably not, it's not sufficient on its own, I don't think. And I think also partly that there isn't probably the, the level of awareness um, of consumers in some, some types of products in particular. Uh, you know, I think we were probably all very shocked to hear about the, um, the factories up in Leicester and the, you know, because I think of sustainability in terms of social dimension as well, not just the environmental aspects. Um, but, you know, shocking to hear that that's happening here in the UK. And, and I think, you know, one of the, the issues that will need to be addressed is the issue of affordable, sustainable um, products, because, you know, there is a demand for really cheap products, but that often leads to unsustainable practices. And how do we accelerate the affordability of, of sustainable um, consumer products? Yeah. John, the role of the consumer? Well, just very quickly, um, in, in the late 80s with a colleague, I did a book called The Green Consumer Guide. It sold a million copies in 18 months. And, and it had, and the movement that it was part of had a huge impact on business. The problem is consumers cannot remain anxious and agitated or angry or whatever for very long. You know, we basically want somebody else to sort this out uh, for us. So now here we are again. I'm not going to rely on uh, millennials and Gen Z and all the rest of it to sort this out for us. I think this is... This is a task for everybody. Everyone's got to take a degree of responsibility. I do think things could be made much easier for people to make the right choices. So I've had my own pension uh, fund for 40 years because I've been sort of largely uh, freelance and um, I had invested it in ESG and socially responsible investment funds. I had somebody review that uh, about a year ago and what he found shocked me rigid uh, and it took me five months of really intensive work to get our investments out of the things that they were in and to put them into the future, at least as I uh, see it. Now, that is criminal. It should not be so hard for people to move their uh, money uh, into uh, from bad things to good things or from you know, not, not so good things into better things. And I think Richard Curtis's uh, Make My Money Matter campaign is fundamentally important. Uh, if it works, it'll cascade in all sorts of other ways. So we must give it uh, as much of a following win uh, as we possibly can. Thank you. So we've got just one minute left. Um, uh, so let me just quickly ask both of you, you know, if there was one thing, one call for action, one message you'd like to give to sort of corporate uh, um, chief executives today, what would that message be? Amelie, do you want to go first? Um, I think be determined to make the changes that are needed. I mean, you know, sort of show that real genuine leadership. And, I, you know, I think what's interesting, we, we saw again, London, uh, sorry, New York Climate Week last week, there's now over 1500 companies that have made a commitment to be net zero. And, you know, and this is phenomenal. I mean, this is trillions of, of um, dollars of value. And, uh, you know, but but so they so showing that leadership is isn't you know you're, it's a lead leadership role within a, a community of leaders on this agenda and and i think you know recognizing though that 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 commitment is excellent but uh it's the commit it's the actions to deliver on that that are now needed over the coming decade thanks john last word to you uh, get out more. Uh, when the roof is coming around your head, the temptation is to stay chained to your desk and sort of do whatever you can. The future is out there. The future is incredibly exciting. It's going to be quite challenging uh, too, but by God, it's exciting. Go out and see some of the people uh, who are helping to create it and seeing what, seeing what you can do to play into that. Uh, so yeah, get out more. Great. So thank you. Look, our, our time is up. So I wanted to, I, I want to thank both our panelists. Thank uh, uh, Amelie, obviously from CDC, and uh, especially John Elkington. Uh, and the book is called Green Swans, and I, 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 I would recommend it to everybody. Um, and that was a fascinating discussion. I mean, we're, we're, we're facing a, a, um, a challenge, a, a huge a challenge of enormous magnitude. 
but I think it's it's uh, it's certainly great to know, uh, John. There are people like you willing to stand up and take a leadership position as you've done for for decades now. And so we thank you for that, and we thank you particularly for spending the time with us today. Thank you, thank and you thank both. you, and thank, thank you for all. what you do. Oh, thank you, and thank you, thanks everybody for listening. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye -bye.